The last several weeks have been a very busy time for uh, many of our friends and co-workers who uh, are, consider themselves Christians. They, uh, those who are parts of certain religions or certain faiths, they have been observing a period of time over the last five weeks or so called Lent. And if you've ever wondered what Lent or the Lenten sacrifices are all about, that's what our lesson is designed on this morning. Because I know I've been asked, what is our church doing for Lent? Maybe you've been asked, what does your church do for Lent? Maybe you observed a friend or a classmate or a co-worker with uh, ash on their forehead a couple of weeks ago on Ash Wednesday. And it all revolves around a 40-day period that started back on Ash Wednesday about five weeks ago. This is the start of the sixth week of Lent. And on Ash Wednesday, they put ashes on their, people take ashes on their foreheads. And it's in representation of mourning, a mourning period leading up to the death and ultimately the remembrance of the resurrection of Jesus as people remember it on Easter. The term Lent literally means the spring season. That's what the term means. And as we said, it's a 40-day period where most people and most uh, churches instruct their members to, and they fast for that period of, at some point during that period of 40 days, not necessarily the whole 40 days, uh, they give up a vice or a luxury over that course of 40 days. They donate their time or money to causes or to their neighbors and friends. And it's based on Christ's fasting for 40 days in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. Kind of based on that is kind of the symbolic nature of the remembrance of Jesus' preparation to go to Jerusalem knowing he was going to be killed. That being the case, I want you to consider a little bit of the history or the, the past of Lent. Because ultimately, there's nothing in the Bible that describes anything about Lent or directs Christians to observe Lent. The first mention of it, the first finding of it, is as it pertains to the Council of Nicaea back in 325 AD, often associated with the kind of the ultimate formation of the Catholic Church. Even today, the Roman Catholic as well as regular Catholic churches, as well Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, and several of the Reformed churches continue to observe the tradition of Lent. In fact, today is, the, as I said, the start of the final sixth week known as the Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday. If somebody asks you about Palm Sunday, this is what they call today, Palm Sunday, the start of the final week of Lent. Now, there are three pillars of Lent, the three kind of basic cornerstones of what Lent is all about. One is prayer. It's about justice towards God, recognition of God's supreme nature of the fact that we are not worthy of him, we're not worthy of Jesus, but prayer kind of represents that concept. The second pillar is fasting, and it's the idea of justice, quote-unquote, justice towards self. It's the self-denial of myself to suffer in some form or fashion as Jesus suffered. And then the third one is almsgiving which is justice towards my neighbors, recognizing that Jesus died for all, therefore I should in some way sacrifice as well for all. And then also mentioned within these three pillars are the characteristics of self-reflection, simplicity, and honesty. Now, it's not that these things are taught as these 40 days during the course of Lent are the only times that you should focus on prayer and fasting and almsgiving. However, and it's quoted as having renewed vigor in these particular aspects of service. Now, we could talk quite a bit. There's tons more material that we could look at regarding the origin of Lent, 
regarding aspects of who all practices Lent. There are variations among some of the different churches as to what all they observe and how, go, how far they go with that. But I'd like to suggest to you this morning that there are three problems, three issues with the way Lent is presented. Doesn't matter by what church. The whole concept of Lent, there are three issues that I'd like to consider. Because when it comes to Lent and the Bible, as we already noted, nothing in the scriptures dictates anything about Lent. We know that it came, and it, it came along 300 years after the church was established. So, what are some issues when we consider what God's word says compared to what Lent and its purpose is? Well, here's one. And not all, not all churches are, are hardline on this, but... When it was first established, or at least in the early days of it being established, it was mandatory that people fast during this period, that they offer up these prayers, that they offer up these alms as well to their neighbors, that all of the different pillars and all the different aspects of Lent was mandatory. Now again, some churches have backed off of that mandatory term, but notice what St. Quote, St. Augustine of Hippo says, and this is in the 370s that he says it, Our fast at any other time is voluntary, but during Lent we sin if we do not fast. Those are very strong terms. We sin if we do not go along with what the, the traditions or the commandments of Lent are. At the Council of Laodicea in 364 AD, they commanded broadly, this is the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, commanded that Lent be observed everywhere. They said it was of the strictest necessity that it be observed. Now, understanding that some, as again, some churches have backed off certain aspects of the fasting part of it. Some of them have had backed off of the dictating of giving up a vice versus a luxury. Uh, there was one individual I knew growing up, his mom, she gave up chocolate at Lent. That was her sacrifice during the 40 days. Every year it was chocolate because that's what she loved. But I want you to consider what God's word says in Mark chapter 7 and in verse 1 starting. In Mark chapter 7 and in verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, talking about Jesus, having come from Jerusalem. Now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. Notice it's not the commandment of the Lord. Is the tradition of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches. So then after Mark kind of establishes this is what was happening, kind of this background of the tradition here, verse 5, the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands. And Jesus answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. And he said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Notice that one of the things that Jesus says to the Pharisees is that there is a difference between what your elders have said and established as tradition versus what God has commanded in the law. Well, the washing of the hands a certain way was never commanded in, in Deuteronomy or in Leviticus or in any of the other law, uh, uh, books of the law. And so as a result, these things are being placed in by men, not by God. 
And these men don't have the authority of God to dictate, here's what the law is going to be now. And so when they come and they ask this question, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? And Jesus says, why are you asking me that question? Because you yourselves, not just do you observe the tradition of the elders, but you do so to the exclusion of the fulfilling of the commandments of God. And he even goes on to bring out specifics regarding honoring your father and your mother. But Jesus makes that differentiation between what God has said versus binding what God has not said. The binding of the commandments or the doctrines of men. And in doing so, it's interesting that in the process of this, not all of the, quote, what many people call the, the church fathers in those early 200s and 300s AD, not all of those individuals who write regarding the events that were taking place and some of their, their writings on the teaching of the gospel and so forth, not all of them agreed with the Council of Nicaea. In fact, Cassianus, and this is around 370s AD, in contrasting the New Testament church with the Catholic church of his day, he said it ought to be known that the observance of the 40 days had no existence so long as the perfection of that primitive church remained inviolate. Which is to say that as long as the New Testament church remained the New Testament church, and it still existed even at this time, but the Catholic church had kind of taken over the predominant uh, attention. But he observes the fact that nowhere in scripture, and for that matter, even as of the late 300s AD, he knew, based on the writings of earlier individuals, that this Lent period, this 40-day observation of fasting and so forth, was never something that the early church did. And he said this in contrast to what the Council of Nicaea said. In contrast to what St. Augustine said. And not all of them agreed with making that a mandate. Saying that you have to observe this. Because God didn't observe it. Or I mean because God didn't command it for it to be observed. And that brings up the question, how can we command or mandate what God has not commanded or mandated? It's, it's in the same vein as a saying that we often have, we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is silent. In the, when it comes to this 40-day period of Lent, it's not commanded by God. Now, to be fair, a lot of modern churches will agree with that. They'll say, oh no, we absolutely recognize that it shouldn't be mandatory because we shouldn't have to make it mandatory. See, true servants of God will want to do this. This will be something they want to do from the heart. Well, again, this goes back to another problem. Not only is one of the problems the fact that at least its early intention was that it was to be mandated, Keep in mind that fact that that was how it was originally intended, was to be mandated and made for it to, uh, to be observed. One of the other problems is that it is used to make a person holy. The, the observation of Lent is specifically designed, its specific purpose is to make a person holy. If you think I'm exaggerating, read what the Catholic Encyclopedia says about Lent. It says that the real aim of Lent is above all else to prepare men for the celebration of the death and resurrection of Christ. The better the preparation, the more effective the celebration will be. One can effectively relive the mystery only with purified mind and heart. The purpose of Lent is to provide that purification by weaning men from sin and selfishness through self-denial and prayer, by creating in them the desire to do God's will and to make his kingdom come by making it come first of all in their hearts. So notice the purpose, notice the design of what Lent is supposed to be. And I'm going to bring out a couple of specific aspects to what is mentioned here. 
Because this goes kind of to the root of the, of the problem. It's not just that in some cases, and it was originally designed to be mandatory, and in some religions it still is mandatory for its observers to uh, observe the fasting and so forth. But sometimes it is taken as a tool to think that by observing it, whether it's mandatory or not, by observing it, I become holy. It's the same thing as saying, by being here this morning and sitting in these pews, we are holy because we're here. It's the same difference. Woke up this morning, I got dressed for, to come to worship the Lord. Well, that's a great thing. That's a good thing. But does it make me holy? Does it make me righteous? Do my works somehow make me pure? See, that's the root of the problem. Because according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, that's what Lent does for its observers. It purifies their mind. But notice that it says it's to prepare men for the celebration of the death and the resurrection of Christ. Obviously, reference to uh, the observation of Easter, which would be coming up next Sunday. That being the case, notice the wording of this. To celebrate the death and the resurrection of Christ. Contrast that statement, knowing that the context is this once a year celebration, with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. We see in verse 24 and in 25, we see the bread and the fruit of the vine as representing the body and the blood of Jesus. And then Jesus, after each one saying, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the same with the, with the bread earlier in verse 24. And in verse 26, notice what Paul says. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, we know that the first century church, the early Christians, they took the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day. Every Sunday, they took the Lord's Supper. It wasn't once a year. It wasn't twice a year. It was every Lord's Day. So then what purpose would there be for an ultimate celebration of the death and resurrection of Jesus once a year if you're already doing that on the Lord's Day? And we're not celebrating, maybe a little bit of a weird term for that. It's not celebrating so much as acknowledging, memorializing that this is what Jesus did for us. This is what Jesus was willing to go through for us. And to an extent, celebrating in the sense that because of this, we now have asked the, the opportunity for forgiveness of sins. That aspect of salvation is available to us because of what Jesus did. But we do it every Lord's Day because that's what God has given us instruction to do. Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So, comparing just that first part, the foundational principle of Lent, which is to prepare people for the celebration of the death and resurrection of Christ... God's already taken care of that in the design of the church to memorialize the death and resurrection of our Lord in the Lord's Supper. But then add to that this statement. The purpose of Lent is to provide that purification. The purpose of Lent is to provide that purification. What are the three pillars? Remember, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. That by doing those three things, that makes me pure? Somehow that makes me holy? Do those things somehow take away my sins? Because that's what purification is. That's what we're talking about. When we talk about purification in a spiritual context, we're talking about the forgiveness of sins. That's the only way I can be pure. Well, these three things, fasting, prayer, almsgiving... While being 
Certainly, spiritual things that the Bible talks about. At no time does the New Testament ever refer to them as things that, that lend themselves to forgiving my sins, at least in the context of in and of themselves by doing them. In fact, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 11, the Hebrew writer, in contrasting the Day of Atonement of the Old Testament with what Christ has done, this is what he says. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 11, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So this is what Jesus did. He entered the most holy place with his own blood, given in our stead. And then in verse 13, this is what the Hebrew writer says, for if the blood of bulls and goats, talking about under the Old Testament, and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, under the Old Testament, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How are people made pure? Through the blood of Jesus. It's not by works that I can do. I can't earn salvation. I can't earn righteousness. I can't earn purification. That's not something that's possible. In fact, Paul has a whole couple of chapters based on this in Romans chapter 4. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 22, there is a component that is connected to what I do, but it's not based on my works themselves. 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 22, Peter says, Since you have purified your souls, notice he says, You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. So Peter says, You have purified your souls. How did I do that? How did I gain purifica uh, purification? Peter says, by obeying the truth through the Spirit. Well, what act of obedience did I do? What submission to God's command did I observe? Was it prayer? Was it fasting? Was it almsgiving? Peter says in verse 23, he tells us what it is. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. What does the word of God teach me? John chapter 3, Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus told Nicodemus, one must be born again if he's to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus doesn't understand. Jesus has to explain, one must be born of water and the spirit. It's all one moment. Baptism. One must be born of water and the spirit if he's to enter the kingdom of heaven. Being born again... Is that act. It is that moment when my soul comes into contact with the blood of Jesus and I am made pure. Now, that's not to say, as we know from 1 John chapter 1, once we become a Christian, if I sin, if I fall short of the glory of the Lord, and I need to ask God's forgiveness, I pray, I repent of my sins, I confess my sins to him, and as John says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So certainly from that perspective, prayer does enter into the equation. But it's nothing that I've done. It's not something that I do that earns that purification. And yet the wording here, the purpose of Lent is to provide that purification. Well, God is able to purify me without man having to provide another construct. God doesn't need Lent to make us pure. Much less God, nor Jesus, needs his people to celebrate his death and resurrection one day a year. Because he's ordained it be done one day a week on the Lord's Day. Then there's this phrase. Weaning men from sin and selfishness through self-denial 
and prayer. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Peter describes the fact this is what we used to be. This is how we used to live. We spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. We walked in lewdness and lusts and drunkenness and revelries, drink parties, abominable idolatries. There's all kinds of, of times where Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there are lists of things that we know we sh should not have been doing, that we did, but now we've turned away from those things and are doing what God wants us to do. That's our focus. Paul reminds the saints in Romans chapter 6 that they are to submit their members as instruments of righteousness unto God, serving him, not serving ourselves. So, granted, we understand that God wants us to turn away from sin and selfishness, that we are to deny sinful lusts, sinful pleasures. But notice how this is being put to everyone. That this construct of the observation of Lent will wean people away from sin and selfishness because they're being told they have to focus on prayer and on fasting and on almsgiving. And so by forcing that, again, that's how it was designed to be observed. It was designed to be mandatory. We're training people to turn away from things they shouldn't be doing. Thus the giving up of a vice. For 40 days. The idea is that if they give up that vice for 40 days, maybe they'll actually give it up for longer than just the 40 days. But the fact of the matter is this. We are not just called to deny our sinful desires 40 days out of the year. God didn't designate just a certain period of time that you have to act holy. And be righteous. Because I want you to be holy for I am holy all the time. Not just 40 days out of the year. In Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 18. Colossians 2 and in verse 18 is a key component of this entire discussion. Because what Paul is addressing seems eerily similar to what we see in the observation of Lent. Paul says in Colossians 2, verse 18, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things that he's not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Verse 20, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, those are those sinful elements, the sinful desires that he's talking about. You died with Christ. You put away that old man that he refers to in Romans 6. Why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. See, it would be one thing, and it is one thing, when God says, I don't want you to do this. Okay. Those regulations or those commandments from God, that's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about regulations and dictates mandates that God hasn't mandated, God hasn't commanded, they're according to the commandments and doctrines of men. And in fact, what he describes is this false humility, this worship of angels, people pretending to be holy, and people maybe even being convinced that by following these regulations, it makes you holy, it makes you righteous. Especially when they're outright being told that this process of Lent provides you purification. It helps to wean you from your sin and selfishness for you to deny yourself, to give yourself in prayer. And to create within you the desire to do God's will. This is what Lent does. How did God not come up with this? How come man had to come up with it? Notice what else Paul says now in verse 23 of Colossians 2. 
these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Think about what Paul just said. Because what he just said literally tears apart the foundations of the very thought of what Lent is supposed to do. We're told that Lent prepares us for the celebration of the death and resurrection of the Lord. That it purifies us. That it weans us from sin and selfishness. That it creates within us that a desire to do God's will. Paul says, these things may look wise. They may look holy, but they have no value against the indulgence of the flesh. They don't do anything. And when man inserts himself to mandate things that seem holy, that seem righteous, this is the very pitfall of every one of those constructs, whether it's Lent or anything else. God didn't command it. But when we start meddling with God's plan, we start meddling with his design and his authority, this is what we get. We get self-imposed religion. We get false humility. We get people denying themselves what they want, the neglect of the body. But we don't get any type of value against actually teaching a person how to live as God wants them to live. Because it doesn't work that way. This is why Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 9, Paul says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul says, we pray for you, that you will grow in knowledge, that you'll grow in wisdom in his will, Talking about God's word. But then notice what he says in verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. The very thing Lent says it's designed to do is what God's word is designed to do. And not just for 40 days out of the year, God's word is designed to increase the desire to do God's will, to prick our hearts, to motivate us to be what we should be every day of the year. That's what, it's, that's what God's word is designed to do. Why would we need Lent if God's word is doing what we need it to do? And then the final thing from that quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia is the statement to make his kingdom come by making it come first of all in their hearts. Which is to say that the construct of Lent is designed to make the kingdom come in the hearts of the observers first so that then the kingdom of God can come in its fullness. But what does God's word say? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and in verse 3, Paul says, We're bound to thank God always for you, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. The love of every one of you all abounds towards each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and your faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Verse 5, that is manifest Evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. We're in a context of persecution. But notice what the root of this is. These brethren are recognizing that this is why we're doing what we're doing. Because of the kingdom of God. Because of one day being in heaven... We have entrance already into the kingdom through baptism in Christ Jesus. But one day we want to get to heaven. So what does Paul say? He says, your faith grows exceedingly. Your love towards each other abounds. We boast of you because of your patience 
and your faith? What is it that makes the kingdom of God come in a person's heart? The word of God does. Not some construct built by man to produce what looks like the kingdom of God. God's word. Because God's word is what produces faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's word brings about love. Because we know that we're to love one another as Christ has loved us. God's word brings about patience and perseverance. You want to talk about what brings the kingdom of God into the heart of man? It's not some construct of denying myself certain vices or certain luxuries over the course of 40 days. Or by giving myself more so to prayer and almsgiving and fasting. It's by giving myself to God's word. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 3, Peter describes all these characteristics. He says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, God's word did not contain the mandate of Lent. So we can safely leave Lent out of the things that pertain to life and godliness. Then he says in verse 5, for this very reason, giving all diligence, he goes through, he says, add your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, verse 6. And then in verse 8, he says, if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how knowledge is a key component here. Verse 9, he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed, purified from his own sins. Verse 10, therefore, brethren. Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How? By observing Lent? Or observing anything else that man mandates? No. No. By giving myself to God's word. By growing in the characteristics that God wants me to grow in. By focusing on those, not for 40 days out of the year, but every day of the year. I can make my call and election sure. The final problem with Lent. The last point we're going to make this morning. Is that the very three pillars... Of the things that are mentioned as being the core components of Lent. The prayer and the fasting and the almsgiving. These are already emphasized by God already. There shouldn't be a need to emphasize these things on 40 days out of the year. When God has already dictated what he wants us to focus on. God tells us he wants us to pray always. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, it's even part of the equipment of the Christian. When Paul says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication with all the saints. Paul emphasizes prayer right there. And it's not in the context of observing Lent. Luke chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus describes this parable about how men should pray always and not grow weary. Prayer is to always be with us. Fasting has its place. But at no time in the New Testament is fasting mandated at any point in the Christian's life. In fact, what we'll do is we'll save Matthew 9 because this is a whole study in itself uh, we'll save that for another sermon. But in Matthew chapter 9, in verses 14 and 15, Jesus is asked by John's disciples about fasting. And Jesus makes a statement there, which leads ultimately to the point that if my disciples simply fasted because they're told to, then the whole point of fasting is moot. Because fasting is reserved for a state of mind, a state of heart. It's generally reserved for deep mourning or some uh, uh, specific preoccupation or issue that one wants to give themselves over to and focus on and give themselves to prayer in. If you fast simply because you're told to, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. 
Almsgiving in the New Testament, the term for alms literally means mercy or pity. It doesn't mean money, and it doesn't mean giving of my, my stuff. It means mercy, pity. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus, in a parable designed specifically to address this individual who says, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus offered the parable of the Good Samaritan. And at the end, Jesus says, who was a neighbor to this poor beaten man? And the individual said, well, the Samaritan. He was the, the neighbor, the one who needs pity shown to them. Jesus says, go and do likewise. That's who your neighbor is. Anyone who needs mercy, who needs pity shown to them. You combine that with passages like James chapter 2 and verse 8 and Galatians 5 and verse 14 that reinstitute the understanding that we are to love our neighbor. We're to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. We're to give ourselves up as servants to others. In Galatians 5, it's to our brethren. In James chapter 2, it could be to anybody. Well, who is our neighbor? Anyone whom mercy or pity needs to be shown. Is that just during 40 days? Or is it every day? Am I only a Christian during Lent? Or am I a Christian every day? Self-reflection, simplicity, honesty is to be a cornerstone of the Christian's character every day. This is the whole component of what it means to examine oneself. To test ourselves to determine whether or not we're in the faith. We have to have self-reflection, not just during 40 days out of the year, but every single day. We have to be honest with ourselves. Because ultimately, no matter what the intention was behind the initial construct of Lent, here's what I know for a fact has happened with the observance of it. Many people infer Based on how Lent is set up and what it's designed to focus on, many people infer that if I sacrifice a vice for 40 days, or if I give up a luxury for 40 days, that makes me holy, that makes up for sins the rest of the year. So that means that it's acceptable to have vices and do not do the prayer, not do the fasting, not do the almsgiving the rest of the year, because I'm going to make up for it come Lent. And I know for a fact that that happens for people. I've had people tell me that. Straight face, completely believing it. That that 40 days that I observe Lent makes up for this other stuff I do during the course of the year. I doubt that was its intention from its outset. But that is the end result. And it goes back to show when you start meddling with God's plan. When you start taking liberties with God's word, when you start loosening where God has bound or you bind where God has never bound, you start including your own commandments, your own doctrines, and all of a sudden the truth of God's word gets lost. This is why as Christians, we look to God's word and his word only. Everything we do, everything we teach, how we worship God, how our congregation is set up and how it, it functions, what we do with the Lord's money, all of it goes back to what the New Testament church did, to what God commanded them to do. And this is why. Because of constructs like Lent that not only can lead people to false assumptions that they're holy by doing these things, but can, in fact, lead people astray from God entirely. We offer an invitation to those who are not Christians this morning to be baptized, to have your sins washed away, be added to the body of Christ. Don't listen to man's construct when they tell you that all you have to do is accept Jesus into your heart to be saved. What does that mean, accept Jesus into your heart? Does that mean have warm feelings? Does it mean to be pricked in your heart? Well, the Jews on the day of Pentecost are pricked in their hearts, but that didn't make them saved. They had to be baptized into Christ Jesus. For those of us who are Christians, we're bombarded constantly with these types of formations like Lent, man's concoctions, 
And it's not just Lent, but it's a whole kind, all kinds of things that, we're folk, that, that we get tossed to every, every week. Maybe it's something that our friends or our neighbors have done at their church that week. Something they've asked us, what are you doing for this holiday or for that holiday? Not only how we respond is important, but making sure that we keep ourselves and our minds and our thoughts focused on God's word to do what he tells us to do. It's a tall order. But we have to stay focused on his word and help others come to see his word as well. If you need help this morning, come forward as we stand and sing.